Um, when you came down with P.T. Riley that first time, that was 55? 50 55 was my first trip through. What was the flow then? Do you remember? I don't remember what the flow was then, but it was, uh, oh, we've got all those records uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 30 or 35,000 cubic feet per second. And, uh, and in 56, it was very similar. Uh, that's the way I remember it. Now, the first year I paid any much attention, I went 55, 56, then I didn't go again until 62. I had a job that kept me from doing this all the time. Uh, but as it happened in 57, the flow got up to 127,600 cubic feet per second. And uh, then in 58, it was very close to that. And in 59, it also hit 90,000, I believe. And uh, the next time I went was in 62, and it was uh, 52,000 something when we started, and 47,000 when we finished, and it was an ideal stage. We didn't have to worry about the beaches in those days. Glen Canyon <coughs> Dam had not come into existence and hadn't started eating away at them the way it's been doing. So we had beautiful camps and beautiful water and very easy water to run on, but thrilling water to run on. And the next time I went was in 64, and uh, as you know, right up when we were up here near Whitmore Wash, an airplane came over and dropped a message that the water had been cut off at Glen Canyon Dam to 900 cubic feet per second. And <laughs> the National Park Service instructed us uh, to leave the river at that point. Now, it wasn't at Whitmore Wash. It was two or three miles this way. You are to remove your equipment from the canyon at this point and go to the rim, and we will notify your rim party. In those days, you had to have a rim party that was watching over your welfare as you went down the canyon. Can you imagine anybody around here who could get here and see how you're doing? It was such a joke that nobody paid any attention. But we always uh, uh, put uh, a rim party on record for the permit because that was required. So very often we'd put uh, Dave Brower or Booker T. Washington or Winston Churchill, anybody on the rim party because it was such a joke. Uh, the Park Service had no idea what was here and uh, the permits were just uh, a farce. And so they were going to notify our rim party. Uh, 900 cubic feet per second in 19... 64 when we were here to create the Sierra Club book, uh, Time and the River Flowing, which was our statement against the dams in the Grand Canyon. That's why we were here. We brought Francois Day, who wrote the book later, and Phil Hyde, who took a lot of the pictures in the book. And uh, so here we were trying to produce that book, and it looked as if the government had cut off the water to destroy the project. Uh, However, John Riffey was in that plane that came over and dropped the message. And uh, so he uh, added a little pencil written note at the bottom of the message that that morning at Bright Angel Creek, the flow was 3,000 cubic feet per second. So it wasn't going to be 900 and for a while yet. So we still had a little daylight, half hour of daylight. So we, we were making camp and we threw everything back in the boats and rode as hard as we could, and we got down 10 miles or so before it got too dark. And then the next day, 35 miles, then 35, and after a while, we were safely ahead of the, of the low flow. But uh, in 65, things began to be what you might call normal. P.T. Riley didn't go anymore. But we began running trips, and it evolved into a business that I kind of got trapped in. And uh, the, uh, the river then was under the control of Glen Canyon Dam, and it reached some terrible extremes, like in 1972 when they cut the water off and had the baloney boats stuck at Hans and all that. And then in 77 again, with dories we could always get through, but the big rigs could not. Uh, their people had to be helicoptered out frequently uh, from some place where they were stopped in the middle of the river and uh, our food had to be brought in to them because they weren't provisioned for the length of time it was going to take. And those were some rough years. Uh, and then we began to work on it and try to go to court and 
create publicity, uh, the hard light of the press and other means of publicity is not enjoyed by the government bureaus at all. They don't like to be uh, examined. They don't like to have it known what they're doing. And so by producing the book we spoke of, which if you haven't read is a beautifully written book, uh, I'd say Francois wrote the best book on the Grand Canyon that's ever been written. And uh, those things began to accumulate. And uh, after a while, we, we had reached the public. And uh, then we're getting back to the place that I spoke of before, where we were running newspaper ads in the New York Times and the Washington Post and so forth, uh, asking the public if they'd like uh, to flood the Sistine Chapel so the tourists could get closer to the ceiling. And, and see Da Vinci's paintings more easily. Because one of the arguments down here for the dams was that people would be elevated and they'd be safe and they'd be up high where they could see better. <laughs> and the river would be wiped out. As you know, the marble dam at mile 39 and below Lee's Ferry was going to back water up to Glen Canyon Dam, was going to divert the water from the river through a pipeline that would come under the Kaibab Plateau and drop the water back down through a powerhouse at Kanab Creek. The dam downstream here was going to back everything up to Kanab Creek, 93 miles, I believe it was. And so the whole canyon would be controlled. And in order to support fish life, they were going to release 100 cubic feet per second from Marble Dam. Now, if 100 fi cubic feet per second comes out of Marble Dam, how far down the canyon do you think it would get before it dried up completely? I mean, what a ridiculous uh, set of circumstances we're asked to accept. And we didn't accept them, and we don't have the dams, but we do have the dam dam up there. And uh, uh, that dam doesn't have to continue to be a disaster. All it has to do is run seasonally adjusted, steady flows. Anybody who doubts that that would work better than anything else they propose only needs to ask Dave Wegner, who is intimidated by the organization he works for, the Bureau of Reclamation, but he is the one person who knows. He can, conducts these uh, environmental studies and so forth, and he knows that, and he'll tell you that. Peak at Hoover. These problems will be ended. Uh, but as you know, he hasn't uh, been very much uh, in favor, I mean favored by his uh, bureau uh, since he uttered those words. He's been kicked downstairs, downstairs, under various supervisors and so forth, so he no longer has the freedom uh, to investigate uh, and to research that he once had. Uh, when he started, uh, he was uh, riding the crest of the wave. He could research honestly and come up with straightforward opinions. Then they began to clamp down on him, and they put other people over him who would filter what he said and digest it and decide how much of it could be published and how much could not. So Dave Wagner, if he were here, I think he would openly tell us what the problems are. And he and I have talked about it so much, and we know, each of us knows what the other thinks, and it's very, very close. But being political, he doesn't think we can win. I think we can win. And we only have to speak with a united voice. But we've got to do something about this. This is a trick. Here we've had very little change in the flow. All the time they're doing this, uh, deciding what they're going to end up doing, the various alternatives, most of which are just farces and not intended to be taken seriously. Uh, all those things are in the offing. And they'll come up with one and they'll adopt it. And they'll say, well, we had all the input from everybody. Everybody had his say. Now, this is the way we're going to do it. They won't say how everybody voted. They'll say they all had a chance to talk about it. They all had a chance to comment. Now we're going to do this. Well, that's what they tell us. And we're going to end up with a situation as bad as anything we had under Glen Canyon Dam. But one of the alternatives out of the many, many alternatives from which they are going to make their final decision the possible alternative was to peak at Hoover Dam and have seasonally adjusted steady flow at Glen Canyon. 
They did not even publish that as, an, as a viable alternative. No. That was not even considered. That isn't even in the cards at all. And yet it's the one viable alternative of all of them that can help or can save the Grand Canyon. But they would not even consider it. They wouldn't let it see the light of day. They, they rejected it in two or three lines in their book. Uh, and uh, it's getting nothing from the Bureau of Reclamation or its various bosses and so forth. Uh, the power that is in this group and in the uh, NAU and uh, in Grand Canyon River Guides and so forth could easily have a tremendous bearing on the Secretary of the Interior, who with a stroke of his pen can fix all this. So all he has to do is say one word or the other. He's in charge of the Bureau of Reclamation, but he's not getting, his back isn't being stiffened by anyone. You know, it's hard to reach him, but a group like this can reach him. The Klein Library and so forth, NAU and everyone else that's involved in the Grand Canyon if they care. Grand Canyon River Guides is now an organization to be, uh, to be dealt with, and the Secretary of the Interior will listen. It only takes one paragraph to explain to him where we are. But is that ever going to be forthcoming? Not that I know of. Uh, he can fix it. Will he? Does he care enough? Does he know enough? He's been told, but uh, unfortunately he seems to be rather political too. Uh, he will do what is right, though, if the newspapers, television, radio, books, people, anyone, and enough people stand up and fight for it. But people are not fighting for it. It's amazing how it's like a lot of cattle being led to the slaughter. They don't know where they're going and they don't care. They're going to have their heads knocked in. They're not objecting. Uh, I think we should object, object loudly, and not sit around uh, making choices among these asinine alternatives that we're faced with. They're terrible. All of them are terrible, except the one that they don't consider, that they wouldn't even publish, uh, and the one that the Bureau of Reclamation itself knows could solve all the problems, knows and admits could solve all the problems. That's the one that's being ignored and, and buried. What was the rationale for dismissing that seasonal alternative? You mentioned in their book they give it a yeah, short trip. I don't, the, the rationale, thing. they never said. They never said why. They know that it's right. And if you could get all the engineers in the Bureau of Reclamation from the upper and the lower basin, and the lower basin doesn't get involved in this, isn't invited to be involved in it, really, uh, get them together, you know what the vote would be. It would be overwhelming that everything move there. And, uh, well, you know, Arizona, Utah, they're worried about things like that. Even though Arizona's in the lower basin, it's so afraid of California getting something or other. And that is uh, paranoia at its worst because Arizona's already got all it will ever get, all it can ever get, all there is. It's got way more than its allocated share under the 1922 compact. It went way above. Uh, what it was authorized, and that's because the Supreme Court uh, wanted to help the underdog. But when Arizona said, you can't count the Salt River and the Gila River against our share of the Colorado River because those are our rivers. Well, now suppose Wyoming said, you can't count the Green River as part of the Colorado. That's our river. Suppose Colorado said the Colorado River is our river. You can't count that. Then where would we be? And then Utah at one time said in their newspaper headlines and so forth, uh, editorials, uh, well, God gave us this water, so it's ours. Well, now, if you'd left it up to God, it would all end up in the ocean and nobody would use any of it. So uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the crazy thing is that Arizona got away with this, that the Salt River and the Gila River are not counted against Arizona's share. Uh, not only are they part of the uh, Colorado River system, but they don't even begin in Arizona. They begin in New Mexico, which is part of the upper basin. So, you know, Arizona was making an ass of itself 
all along, and nobody seemed to care. The Supreme Court gave Arizona this extra 2.8 million acre feet. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. But everything that the upper basin and Ar states and Arizona will do, and Nevada, hurts us all because unfortunately, and there's a long story in this that we won't go into here, it makes California go out and get the water and or the power somewhere else. And as far as I'm concerned, I'd rather see the upper basin uh, and the whole basin of the Colorado River, the watershed, stay undeveloped and let California develop to a fairly well. Uh, it'd keep our wonders wonderful. Uh, there's nothing much more California can get anyway. Uh, you have to give California credit that in the early days, around 1900, it was already using Colorado River water at its own expense. It didn't get federal money, federal projects. It didn't have a central Arizona project with that vast canal system and all that, paid by the taxpayers in Pennsylvania and Ohio and everywhere. They don't even realize how they're being stuck for things like that. When California went for these things, the Imperial Irrigation District built those vast canals. Uh, the Metropolitan Water District built the canals and tunnels and so forth that took the water to Southern California. And uh, then when Hoover Dam was in process of being planned, and the expense was talked about. Uh, California said, well, if Arizona and Nevada won't pay their share, we'll pay it for them. And as a result of that, Arizona and Nevada never did pay their share. And uh, the dam is operated by the city of Los Angeles, uh, not by the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, which owns it. That's Hoover Dam? Hoover Dam, yeah. Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and the Southern California Edison Company operate Hoover Dam. Um. When you did those first, and Parker Dam, and so far. When you did those first trips, the fifty, well, fifty-five. It was one in fifty-five, and then, and then the next one was sixty-two. Fifty-six. Fifty-five, fifty-six, sixty-two. In fifty-five and fifty-six, what did the place look like? How has it changed? What was it like then? Well, and and, and how is that different from what it's you like? You now? don't make notes. When you start a river trip, you don't really make notes saying, "I'm going to." notice what the river's like now so that I can note the changes later. You don't think of that. You may today note what it's like and try to remember what it was then, but uh, uh, no, there wasn't any thought of that. The, the main difference that, you, that anyone would notice was that when you got to a beach, there were no footprints on it. When you got to Redwall Cavern, it was just smooth as, as a carpet in there. Not all the volleyball games had taken place. There was nobody else there. There might have been one or two other trips on the river that year, but only under the rarest of circumstances would you ever encounter them. Uh, very few people were going through then. In fact, in 1955 when we went, until we went through, only about 175 people had ever gone down the Grand Canyon. When we finished, it was 185. Uh, as I recall. Anyway, that's the way Doc Marston had it. Uh, the main difference that you would note between then and now was the, the peninsulas of earth, of sand, that came out into the river, that overlapped one another as you looked down the river uh, uh, with flowers on them and uh, willows, uh, uh, vines, and so forth and never a human footprint on any of them. And of course, all that space and all that camping space uh, would have been available to anyone who was here, but there just wasn't anybody. Redwall Cavern is a, is a shock if you compare it, what it is like now, to what it was like then. Not only did the beach go way out, uh, but today it's just pocked with footprints everywhere. And when we went down in 55 and 56, there wasn't a single footprint and uh, cliff swallows were nesting in the back of the cave there, and their little nests were there, mud nests, and the babies, when they'd hear you coming, would stick their heads out and open their mouths, thinking you were mama. And, of course, there's been no life like that for years and years. Uh, we didn't think that it would ever, it never occur to us to, occurred to us to think that would ever be a place that would be so beaten down by human feet, the way it's become, you know. 
you've got hard banks now where people land and set up their kitchens and, and all this and that. And uh, we used to always camp on damp sand because it went out near the river and usually it was very hot and you wanted to be as close to the river as possible. So you camped on damp sand and avoided dry sand. Well, the reason for that was that if the wind blew at night, you'd get sand in your ears and so forth. You want everything perfect. So you'd make your bed on the damp sand and then dry out your brown cloth in the morning. And that way you kept cool in June or July when it's so blistering hot here. Um, the, uh, now we look for dry sand because we're looking for any sand, anything we can count on. If we camp on damp sand, we might be floating before morning because the water is going to come and go. But we always went down the river on a declining stage. In other words, after it had peaked for the year, or as far as we knew it had peaked for the year, sometimes it did have a second peak, but the water was going down. In July, it was going down. After about the end of the first week of July, you could count on the water receding. Therefore, you had all these great vast sweeps of beach where you could put your bed and never have to think about the water coming up. The water went down. And of course the water was muddier than it is now, most of the time. Um, would you say there was a lot more, there were a lot more beaches, more and bigger and all that stuff? More what? More beaches. More beaches? Yeah, and were they bigger? Well, I think everyone knows that the beaches have largely disappeared. Some of them have just been moved around and changed, uh, and some of the apparent enlargement of beaches has come about because where the eddies and other currents have tended to keep the beaches there, people use those spaces because they're available. And in so doing, lots of people trample around over them and open them up. Uh, the place we were last night, you remember, there were lots of little trails and camping spots and so forth, which if people hadn't used that area, would have been totally covered with plants. But here we created the open spots. Or we didn't, but we, the human race, did by using a place like that so heavily. So that's what's made a lot of it available, uh, where there's not much beach compared to what there used to be, uh, but these beaches have been created by human use. Um. Why is it important to have the river be natural? To have what? To have the river be natural, or as natural as possible. Well, there are several reasons why the river should be natural. One is the, the joy of running on a natural river and knowing that you're as close to nature as you can be. And the other is whether we run it or not that nature has its rights. It has a right to be here untrammeled, unfettered. Uh, man doesn't have to screw everything up. And yet we go out of our way to do so. The West was something to open for grabs. You know, when after Powell, everybody was going to start irrigating and doing all kinds of things in the West. And uh, those things can't be done, of course. Uh, but greed was the motive. And uh, it's important to frustrate greed. Uh, we're all greedy for one thing or another, but some of our desires, I think, are on a higher plane than some of those of others. And we, uh, we have no right to change this place, even though our change is only very temporary. In the long run, as Pat Riley used to say, you'll never know those dams were there. In 100,000 years, there won't be a trace of them. And there won't be a trace of us either. But uh, uh, do we have a right even to interrupt nature, even for a short time, to exterminate species, uh, to kill the last fly? Uh, that's not really our right. We're, we're the aberration on Earth. Humans are what's wrong with the world. And uh, it shouldn't show down here. We should be as close to what creation brought us as we can be. And we need to be sensitive to it, aware of it, and appreciative of the fact that we have this place to enjoy because of natural processes. 
which we had no control over, couldn't have changed, but uh, just the same, we're off on the edge of nature and uh, we ought to show appreciation. It's the same thing about throwing garbage around and so forth. Uh, uh, those are things that are so obvious and we can easily control. But when we're here, we should stop and think that we as a people, we as a race, we're controlling uh, the present as we have the past of this place and the future of the Grand Canyon. And as an experience, which is a soulful experience, a really deep experience this canyon can be for people who are attuned to it, we should make it the best possible experience. And uh, uh, that means uh, the canyon should be as wonderful, as natural, as it's possible for it to be. This is one thing why I'm disturbed about uh, these baloney boat trips who race by and don't slow down for Tapete's Creek and so forth. On the one hand, you say, well, those people are missing the wonders of the canyon. They don't go up in that catamiba or anything. Uh, they're missing the wonders of the canyon, and yet somehow you have to be thankful that they are because there are already too many people appreciating, exploring, and impacting the wonders of the canyon. We have to be awfully careful. The most careful we can be is by what's going on at that dam up there, changing that. What we do down here is relatively trivial. Well, I, I think the use is the use level is an issue, and it's can't it's, hear you. I think the the use level is an issue, and it's coming up. It's they're going to rewrite the plan uh, yeah. by next year, ninety six. Yeah. It's it's too bad the people who rewrite plans all the time aren't the people who know how to do it. <laughs> um, the Park Service comes and goes. It's a transient bunch, you know. And by the time you have a Grand Canyon National Park superintendent who begins to know the score, he's gone. And then you've got to train somebody else. And it's up to us to train them. But they don't always listen. And uh, uh, the plan, there is overuse. But on the other hand, what else can you do? There's only one Grand Canyon for all these people. And uh, when they came up with this plan to eliminate motors, I was ambivalent about that. Actually, if nobody could go on a motor trip, there would be fewer people going down the Grand Canyon, but there would still be a lot of people. And if you slowed everything down to the pace of a rowing trip, let's say half the speed of a motor trip, then at any given time you would have twice as many people in the canyon, provided you allowed the same number of people to go through. And that didn't look good either, so one of our attitudes was if they want to get through clutching their airline tickets and unable to wait for the other end of the line uh, and are willing to pay the money and so forth, then I'm afraid we'll just have to let them go, but let them go fast and let them get out of our way while we enjoy the Grand Canyon. I know that seems like a rather crude way of putting it, but uh, uh, you wouldn't want all that traffic piled up. In